morning. Welcome to the Chicago Humanities Festival in Evanston. Why isn't it the Evanston Humanities Festival? You'll have to ask the organizers that. Uh, Maureen, you've written this wonderful book, The Year of Voting Dangerously. Uh, has anything um, caught your attention in the last 24 hours? Nothing. I mean, the cops? <laughs> well, I mean, the, it, <laughs> see, even columnists are a little political. Um, what do you make of the events of the last 24 hours here, nine days before the, uh, the election? Um, you know, when I met David, uh, I actually, you know, we were together on the bus um, when the Sarah Palin announcement came down. <laughs> David said, this is either going to be really good or really bad. And we know what happened there. So um, I thought the 2008 race was the most amazing race I'd ever seen. It was like a Game of Thrones episode, the handsome young African-American prince coming and usurping the queen. And it had race, it had gender. You know, it was, I was on the road for a year and a half. I just was mesmerized. So I thought, that's it. There's never going to be. <laughs> There's never going to be another race like that. So then Trump comes down the escalator, <laughs> and uh, Hillary's aides get out sledgehammers and bleach and begin cleaning emails. And um, this race, you know, uh, Stefan has, Bill Hader has that skit on Saturday Night Live where he reviews discos and he goes, This club has everything. So this race has everything. It has <laughs> Russian hackers, white supremacists, dueling Kardashian-like Twitter feuds, dueling federal investigations, small hands. <laughs> and it's the first race where not one but two candy companies have denounced the Republican nominee. <laughs> Skittles issued a denouncement because um, Trump Jr. compared refugees to Skittles in another humanizing Trump family moment. And uh, then Trump and Tic Tacs, we all know what happened there. So, and also on top of all that, we have Julian Assange in a ladies' bathroom in the Ecuadorian embassy trying to get his internet back. <laughs> And now we have G-men on the case again this weekend. So I don't think we'll ever see a race like this again. I think that's a fair summary of the great pageant of democracy. <laughs> uh, you wrote in uh, one of your columns in this book about uh, Hillary Clinton and the Clintons. Um, uh, you said, certainly Hillary wants a lot of control. She has spent a lifetime cleaning up messes sparked by her overweening desire for control and her often out of control mate. She always feared that her emails could become fodder for critics, and now they have. Everyone is looking for signs in how, uh, in how Hillary approaches 2016 to see if she's learned lessons from the past trouble. But the minute the story broke, she went back to the bunker, even though she had known for months that the Republicans knew about the account, the usual hatchets. Uh, Philippe Reines, David Brock, Lanny Davis, and Sidney Blumenthal got busy. The Clintons don't sparkle with honesty and openness. Between his lordly appetites and her queenly prerogatives, you always feel as if there's something afoot. Everything needs to be secret from the Rose Law Firm records that popped up in a White House closet two years after they were subpoenaed for the formulation of her health care plan, uh, to, uh, subpoenaed to the formulation of her health care plan. Yet the Clintons always act as though it's bad form when you bring up their rule bending. They want us to compartmentalize just as they do, to connect the dots that form a pretty picture and leave the other dots alone. Um, what is it? You covered Hillary Clinton for years, and you have some flattering columns in here uh, about her. What, what is it about her that, that, that creates this sense of paranoia? And I, and I would point out that even paranoids have enemies, so. <laughs> That's true. Um, you know, I've given this a lot of thought, and 
it's, I think it's hard because Hillary has a very idealistic public service side that she's had her whole life. But then she has another side where she makes decisions from a darker place of fear and insecurity. And the latter side tends to trip up the former side a lot. And, you know, this latest thing is just uh, a bad pattern for the Clintons in so many ways. Um, when I interviewed, I went uh, in the primaries and interviewed people in Hollywood, because that had been such a civil war in 2008, and I just wanted to see how they felt about Hillary. And they were all on board, you know, they weren't that excited. They weren't going to many fundraisers and stuff because they said we have plenty of pictures of ourselves with the Clintons. But <laughs> one uh, woman who is a political consultant for the Star said to me, you know, the trouble with the Clintons is you get right in the middle of a campaign or a presidency and then there's a snake in a can that jumps out. It's like, she said, it's always like the Dorothy Parker line, what fresh hell is this? So here we are, what, 10 days before the election, and there's a Clinton, you know, snake in the can that jumps out, and all of their agenda and is at risk, and the donors are having emergency meetings today. And so, you know, it's the same old pattern of records coming and going and popping up in a closet, or emails coming and going, and she says they've been given, but now it turns out they're on Puma's laptop that she shared with her her husband. <laughs> yeah, I hate to use the phrases laptop or snake in the can in this case. I think they... <laughs> uh, right, I forgot. Yeah, I know, that's like a New York Post headline. But, yes. um, yeah, it's like, <laughs> right. Tell them what the New York Post headline was. It, oh, oh, you have to say. It was a stroking gun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So tell them what your tweet was about Wiener. Well, I don't want to get into my... You can see it on Twitter. Uh, yeah, well, you can see my tweet on uh, Twitter. But I said, essentially, here was a man uh, of... I didn't have enough space to say overweening ambition. So I said, <laughs> great ambition, and now he'll be a footnote in history. And I said, parenthetically, at least I think it's a foot. So, <laughs> David, but, David is a brilliant punster, and sometimes we try to pun together, but I can't. Compete. No, that's not true. We go on for hours. <laughs> I know, but I'm not good at it. But anyway, so this is, you know, I tried to figure out what happened with Hillary, why she's so paranoid, and why she needs these attack do dogs like David Brock and Sidney Blumenthal who feed the paranoia in this unhealthy way around her. But I think... You know, she obviously had a rough time in Arkansas. When I started covering her in 92, I have these stories in the book, she, you know, was chafing at the idea of first lady. She wanted to call it first mate, and she got, during that so, race... So she could jump overboard? <laughs> <laughs> and um, during that race, she got stationery delivered to her that left out the Rodham, so it was just Hillary Clinton, and she sent it back. She was very upset about that. But I was very sympathetic to her, because I think it is hard for these women like Michelle and Hillary, who have the exact same educational credentials and amazing qualifications, and then they're expected to get in this antiquated little satin box of the First Lady. And so she chafed at that, but then when they got to Washington, and the Whitewater story happened, I think she began to, you know, Trump has his wall and she has an emotional wall. And she began to really build that wall high and it's gotten higher and higher ever since. It's kind of ridiculous when you think about it that she has a press conference once every, what, 250 days? Well, that, that, that's not true anymore in fairness. I mean, she has been interacting with Well, now with she has conference. to because the FBI has found this laptop, but... But they are, she also talking, she has press on her plane and she's communicating with them on a regular basis, so. Right, but she is behind an emotional wall. And yeah, no, as I, David has put it best, he says, you know, she has an allergy to transparency. And you saw it <laughs> even with the pneumonia case where... She has remarkable stamina, I think, and of course you get sick when you're on the road, but even, you know, a natural thing to say she's not feeling well, she can't say. She comes out and says, oh, I feel great, and kind of ditches the press and goes to her daughter's house. And, you know, again, there's this 
uh, as David said also, it's the stealth, not the health. Like just why is the first reaction to everything to hide it? And oh, so I was gonna tell you, so George Stephanopoulos said that if he could bring a genie out of a bottle and change one thing about his time in the Clinton White House, it would be to um, get, persuade Hillary to give the Whitewater Papers to the Washington Post because the story would have been over in a week. And instead, it led to impeachment and $80 million worth of federal investigation, six or seven. And so with the Clintons, you know, in the end, you never even know if there's anything there. It's like, you know how Alfred Hitchcock has this thing called a MacGuffin that just drives the plot, but it isn't even that important. So they have a MacGuffin where the plot is getting driven. It drives, it's like Tantalus, the myth of Tantalus. It drives the press and their foes into this frenzy. But you never really know, is there anything there? You know, it's just this unhealthy symbiosis which comes from the allergy to transparency. You know, uh, just on that, on that, I think that that was a parable uh, of the problem you speak of, that, that moment when she was, became ill at the 9-11 right. it was like a ceremony. Microcosm. Because if they had said at that moment, look, she, had, she was walking pneumonia, she was advised to stay home for the day, uh, or for a couple of days, but she really wanted to be here, and it just was, it was a, b a bad idea, so she's going back home. Uh, she would have gotten a lot of credit for that, but waiting six hours to tell people and going, and going outside and exposing herself to those cameras when she wasn't feeling well was, uh, was a self-destructive decision, which is when I tweeted what I tweeted. Well, you know, it's interesting reading, you know, the Podesta emails, because what her... What uh, Neera Tandon and John Podesta and people who came over from the Obama, you know, camp worry about are the same things that I worry about. And it's interesting to see them worrying about it. They say, Neera Tandon says, apologies are her Achilles heel. She just doesn't know how to make them or doesn't act like she means them. She didn't know how to get on top of the email thing. And Neera and John Podesta are saying, you know, her judgment is problematic. And so the same things we worry about are the same things her inner circle is worrying about. And John Podesta is also saying that she has these creepy people around her who feed the paranoia, um, like Sydney and David Brock. So, you know, it's interesting because they worry about what I worry about. And so that was, you know, it isn't that what they say in the emails is, um, disqualifying in any way, it just reinforces what some of us are already worried about with her. Luckily, there's a candidate on the other side who has <laughs> no flaws, is a paragon of uh, character and mental health. Right. So uh, people have a distinct opportunity there. I, I, before I get to him, though, because I can talk about Gary Johnson endlessly. Uh, <laughs> I want to, uh, I just one last thing on Hillary. You, you talk about her Arkansas days. Um, I thought the most revealing, I agree with you completely. I've, I've worked for her when she ran for the United States Senate and I watched her when she was in the Senate. Obviously I worked for Barack Obama in 2007 and eight, but I worked with Hillary Clinton in the White House when she was Secretary of State. And, um, and I've experienced personally uh, her, uh, her commitment and frankly her kindness uh, in support of my, the cause of my life, which is epilepsy research. My wife started an epilepsy research foundation. And we had no greater champion than Hillary Clinton when she was first lady and after. Um, but there was a piece in the Times about her father. And you probably saw it, Amy Chosick, excellent revealing piece. And in it, it said that uh, he used to uh, wake her up at dawn to study for her math test. And she'd come home with an A and he'd say, uh, you don't have a very hard school, do you? Right. Uh, exactly. And uh, or if 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 she or her brothers left the cap off the toothpaste, he'd throw the toothpaste out in the snow, and make them go and get it. Um, this doesn't seem like Ward Cleaver to me. <laughs> and these kinds of things leave scars. Right. I mean, I you know we've talked about this a lot. It would be remarkable influence that fathers have had on modern presidencies. And in this book, I 
I really wanted to re-report and write an essay about Bush father and son. Yes. I covered the Bush senior White House and Bush Jr. And so nobody beat the Bushes like you. <laughs> <laughs> I have this essay, which I'm really proud of, and you know, to me, the father and son relationship, loving and competitive, led to the worst foreign policy mistake maybe in American history. So, you know, the influence of fathers is just huge. And I mean, how do you see it with Obama, the fact that he grew up with Obama? Well, I find the most intriguing question about Barack Obama and you, I know where you'd probably, how you'd probably resolve it because um, there are a lot of essays in here on him that reflect um, your thinking on him, which we'll get to. <laughs> um, but what I find remarkable is um, most politicians, Bill Clinton for, is a great example. He, was, he lost his father at an early age. His mother went off and he was left with his grandparents. Not dissimilar to Obama's circumstance, but what it propagated in Bill Clinton was this sort of unquenching thirst for approbation. I mean, he lives for it uh, in every way. And, uh, and I, I never saw that in uh, Obama. He, he's a guy who, I mean, he, he, he's very family oriented. Nothing means more to him than being with his kids. And, um, you know, I told him when he was thinking of running for president, I said, I don't think you're pathological enough to run for president. <laughs> Uh, but my, I'm, I'm, I, and I mean to ask him, I'm, I'm hoping to sit down with him for a, a podcast, and one of the things I want to ask him about, but don't tell him, is why? How is it? You know, and I've asked his siblings about that, or his, his sister, I should say, about that. Because his mother wasn't around a lot either. She was pursuing her career. He was with his grandparents. Um, so I'm, I'm eager to, uh, I'm eager, but I think... <coughs> how you relate to your parents, how your parents relate to you, whether you get that sense of love and, or not, you know, uh, if success is, is uh, if, I'm sorry, if love and approval is conditioned on achievement, um, what does a failure mean to you? It's not just a failure in whatever you're pursuing, it's in your own consciousness, the threat of loss of, uh, of, of approval. So anyway, as, as, as long as we're deep into psycho battle, battle let's move on to Donald Trump. <laughs> Speaking of Actually, pathology. because his father and that father-son relationship is pretty formative to who he is. And you've spent a lot of time with him. Right. What, ta mm -mm. Talk about what you see in him. Right. Well, yeah, I, I've been working on a magazine piece, which is going to appear the weekend before the election, and so I've talked to, he doesn't have that many close friends, but, you know, he's, he has a lot of acquaintances, but he, I've tried to talk to his close friends, and they say his father was very influential, his father was, you know, a tough guy who told him that there are winners or you're nothing, you know, so it's one or the other, and who sent him off to a very strict military school when he was getting in trouble or kind of being obstreperous or bullying. So, and as, you know, as someone who has covered him said to me, he never really left the military school. That's where he got this taste for belligerence and fighting, and he still loves belligerence and fighting. I asked He him, and Joe Biden are going to go at it sometime. So. <laughs> right, in the back of the gym. Right. I asked him uh, when the violence first started happening, in a bad way in, at the Chicago rally in the summer, I asked him, I said, you know, aren't you worried that something bad will happen? Reporters are getting roughed up, people or minorities are getting roughed up. And he paused and he goes, no, I think that adds a certain level of excitement. So he does have that kind of attitude, you know, that came from his father sending him off to military school. Well, he's excited. <clears throat> yeah. You know, um, he, uh, I, I read a profile of him in the Washington Post uh, in which he said or, the, or someone said to them, uh, wasn't denied by the Trump people, so I assume they accept this, that his childhood hero 
uh, were, was not, you know, were, were not real estate magnates, certainly not political figures. It was Flo Ziegfeld. Oh, that's interesting. The producer of the yeah, Ziegfeld Files. Yeah, and he started Files. out in a very theatrical way, wanting to, you know, go to Hollywood or something. But also, this is interesting. This didn't make the piece. So, well, uh, you know, he came, he, New York was like Oz to him. So he's over on Avenue Z in Queens. And his father built uh, middle, working middle class housing in Queens and Brooklyn. So he's looking over at the spires of Manhattan like Oz. Um, and he you know, wants to go over. And so he starts hanging out at Yankee Stadium with George Steinbrenner, Lee Iacocca, Roy Cohn, uh, <clears throat> Bill Fugazi, who was the limo king of New York, and another guy named Mike Forrester, who was the furrier to the stars. And they all were these outsized personalities. And he began modeling himself on these guys. And they all started hanging out at this place called Le Club, which was a private club in Midtown New York with models and actresses. And, you know, and that's Sounds how very he... Sounds sophisticated. Yeah, so that's how he... So he formed a character, a kind of larger-than-life character that he played. And that's what one of um, his friends said to me, that this uh, character he's playing in the race is another character he created. And that's why he really is mystified if I say to him, you know, you're you're doing things that are racist and sexist, he's kind of mystified. He'll go, Maureen, you know I'm not a racist or a sexist. Because to him, this bigoted, wall Mexican, as rapist person is a character he's created to win the primaries. Um, right, which, you know, uh, I thought about this and some of your columns this morning when I read his comments about Jim Comey, the FBI director, because he spent months uh, tearing down the FBI and questioning their integrity. And uh -huh. uh, now Comey uh, did what he did yesterday, and he is the paragon of virtue in Trump's eyes. Right. And, and in your book, you It's, you, it's like Putin. You, you know, if you do one thing he likes, then you're great. If you do something he doesn't like, you're a failure and a loser and a dope. Yeah, flattery as a strategic weapon is kind of scary, though. Here is, um, he, he uh, in, uh, you wrote in your book, you noted that in, uh, uh, in 2008, he said about Hillary Clinton and her vote on Iraq, don't forget the decision was based on lies given to her. He says she's very smart and has a major chance to be our next president. Uh, he was a, an admirer of, of her before he wasn't. Well, that's what my magazine piece is about. So, yeah, and to me, too, he, he would praise the Clintons, and he partly rebuilt his golf course in Westchester because Bill couldn't, Bill was rejected from four different golf courses in Westchester because the Mark Rich pardon and the impeachment and he was kind of in Purdo when he first got to yeah. New York and Trump was like. They don't like people who misbehave with women, I guess. <laughs> right. So Trump was like, well, I have a golf course and it was a good entree to get to know the Clintons. But he did say, many wonderful things about them. But as Roger Stone, Trump's uh, associate, says, <laughs> you know, it's all business. Like, in that case, the Clintons were good for business. Trump donated to them and invited them to his wedding. They were good for his business. But now his business is running for president, and they're in the way. So he is an emotional sociopath. So he has no guilt about completely viciously turning on them. And of course, Bill is. Uh, dismayed and furious about this because no other candidate would have dragged his accusers to a debate, which I think was one of the most bizarre moments in political history, or dragged the blue dress back onto the stage. Yeah. You, you know, the thing about that concerns me um, is he doesn't seem to see <laughs> the impact. He doesn't seem to understand the impact of what he's doing. He doesn't, the tearing down of institutions no, he, he of doesn't. people. Oh, and that's the other thing. So one of his friends. These are, these are just yeah, he tactics. Doesn't. Right, tactics. Because everything is just trying to win. In the same way that on Howard Stern's show, Howard Stern could goad him into saying all these vulgar and crude things because he was trying to win the ratings on Howard Stern. Now he's trying to win this, so it's just tactics. But one of his friends said to me, um, Donald always creates a trap door. 
to get out of. And so that's what the rigged thing is about. Like he used to say, when the you can't lose. Yeah, when the apprentice didn't win Emmys, he would, you know, say, well, the Emmys are rigged. So now it's like the election is rigged. So that's his trap door. You know, I uh, my my concern is that he's also unleashed and and uh, whipped up primal forces in our country. And I want to talk, uh, I want to in one second talk about that and talk about <laughs> your siblings as a window into uh, this whole uh, discussion. Uh, but I, I just, I, I want to point out, I, I'm going to make an analogy that is um, going to be familiar to everyone in this audience, less so to you. But Harold Washington was the first African, -Amer uh, African American mayor of Chicago, great larger than life character and the day after he, he he was elected with very few white votes became mayor ran for re-election and then the woman who had been mayor before him Jane Byrne ran against him again and her record was less than stellar uh, and yet she started off the race ahead and he won after a tough race the primary and he got and we're in a room at City Hall because I was working for him by then and he said well what percentage of the white vote did I get and, he's, and, and uh, he said, uh, I said, 21%. He said, uh, I, you know, I've been a great to the whole city. Now I get 21% um, of the vote as opposed to eight last time, white vote. And we're happy about that. He said, ain't it a bitch to be a black man in the land of the free and the home of the brave? But the, the point is, I asked him about Verdoli, uh, Ed Verdoliak, who led the charge against him, who was the in the city council, a white majority against him. And uh, Ed Burke, who was still here, who was his sidekick. And I said, why do you always attack Vidoliak and not Burke? He said, because I think Burke uh, is, was raised, he is a racist, I, I believe that. And I understand that's almost easy, easy for me to understand. Vidoliak, and by the way, Ed Burke ended up raising a, an African-American child, and Harold would have been, I think he may have changed his view. But he said, Vidoliak uses race uses race. He's not a racist. He uses race to get his political way. And he said, and that I find unforgivable. It seems to me Donald Trump uses all of these things yes. as tools. He, whether he believes it or not, he is unleashing these primal forces in our country and sort of surfing them yes. in ways that are really destructive. That was a long story. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, that's exactly, that's a brilliant distinction because that's why Donald Trump doesn't understand. He and Ivanka are only now, they've been in denial. They are only now beginning to realize that their brand is trashed. And the Trump organization has had to come up with a different name for the new hotels they're opening. They're calling them Scion. And the Trump Place apartments in New York have taken his name off the doorman and the place and the doormats, and um, they're calling themselves the Trump Place apartments are calling themselves the Riverside apartments. So I think it's sinking, and there's a boycott against Ivanka's clothing line. So I think I think they could take his name off the side of the building downtown. <laughs> Yeah, so I think it's sinking in. What he did not understand was that you are what you say at the microphone. I mean, that's what I was trying to get at when I interviewed him. Like, if you, you know, don't you understand that when this stuff happened at, at rallies, because of what you said, you become a racist and, a, you know, uh, a sexist because of what you say. But he, again, I think because he thinks he's creating a character. But actually, I have a question for David, since you're on Wait the subject of, of race. I just have one question. Why, when we felt we had made these amazing leaps forward in terms of race and ethics and everything with President Obama, why does it seem like we're in free fall on all that stuff? Well, I don't think we're in free fall. I think race has been a, a fault line and, and, and a kind of um, a, uh, affliction in our, <laughs> in our politics and in our society from the very beginning the original sin. And uh, the election of the first African-American president, I think, was never going to be an antidote to all of that. It may have surfaced some of the things that were always there, just as um, the notion of police uh, abuse of authority in minority communities is not new. It only seems that way because we now all have cell phones and video and we see it. So I think what 
what is out there is more evident. Now, I do think, and this is a good segue back into, because I'm supposed to be asking the questions, <laughs> a good segue back into uh, the question I want to ask you, because while Donald Trump may be exploiting these passions, there's something real going on in the country, something that a lot of the elites, and I include myself among them, uh, missed uh, that allowed him to get to this point. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it reminds me of a bank robber who goes into a bank and expects to find a lot of guards and locked doors and just walks in and takes the money. That's Donald Trump in the Republican primary. You know, I mean, he looked like shocked to find himself on the debate stage. And I know, I know no one is more surprised to, that he is where he is today than Donald Trump. And, um, you know, my siblings, my conservative siblings, my little basket of deplorables, as I call them, <laughs> um, have essays in the book. And, you know, they are trying to vote for Trump because Hillary Clinton keeps saying, I'm the only thing standing between you and the abyss or you and the apocalypse. But to them, you know, she's the apocalypse. And this is hard for liberals to understand. They, they blame the media. They think if we just did a better job explaining who Donald Trump is, that no one would vote for him. But, you know, all of my fellow columnists uh, go on these Margaret Mead expeditions to find, <laughs> to find Trump voters and reason with them. And one of them put out an open letter, I would like to meet a Trump voter and reason with you. And every time I pick up the Sunday paper, one of them is in a Kentucky cafe, the same Kentucky cafe, <laughs> looking for a Trump voter. But I just have to go home. So the reason these essays are good is because it explains to you how Paul Ryan is thinking. If Paul Ryan weren't muzzled and you could hear what he was thinking, it's like my siblings, because they want to vote Republican, but you know they don't want to vote for Trump. As my brother said, that wasn't my first, second, third, or fourth choice. <laughs> um, but you know, they have reasons. And, and I also kind of defend angry voters a little bit, not the racists and sexists, but other angry voters, because they have reason to be angry. We went to this forever war, which was unjustified. And nobody in the country knew the difference between Sunni and Shia. We, the economy almost collapsed without any of us knowing what a derivative was. You know, globalization was presented as this bright, shiny new thing without anyone in Washington realizing there were large swaths of people who had been left behind. So Trump voters want to use Trump as a baseball bat on Washington. You know, there are these rage rooms opening around the country where people take a baseball bat and smash a TV set to feel better. And that's Anybody how- Anybody who watches these, uh, yeah. these ads are probably yeah. among them. Yeah, and that's how, they, that's how they think of Trump, so. So, uh, I, in, in reading uh, your book, uh, I noticed that there's no ending to it. Like, we don't know how the story ends. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, how, how, how much do you think, uh, how highly do you rate the prospect of a, of a Trump presidency? I don't. I, I have never thought he could want, win because to me it's like who framed Roger Rabbit? So you've got a tune and a human. And this is sometimes... <laughs> <laughs> And this is sometimes why the press has a hard time figuring out how to cover him, because he's a tune. And uh, we've never seen anything like it, and I don't think we will again. I think he's going to disappear like a fiery this is a, this comet is a good disagreement. hitting the ocean. This is, this, <laughs> this is, I'm sorry, I stepped on your yeah, line Yeah, no, there. that's okay. This is a disagreement that you and I have. Yeah. When I look at Donald Trump, I see a guy who absolutely loves the... The, the, the crowd. He loves to be the center of attention. The notion of him going quietly into the night seems almost impossible to me. I don't think he will want to, but I also think this is part of what I think is sinking in this week. His customers are not the people at his rallies. His customers are people like some right. of my colleagues in journalism who are cancel canceling their trips to the Scottish Golf Club and taking a $5,000 loss to do so. 
um, you know, I went over to his hotel in Washington the other day because I had heard they cut the room prices in half and no one's there. So I went over, so no one's there, right? So I went with my colleague, Carl Hulse. And under the Trump sign, there's an African-American family uh, having their picture taken. And uh, Carl thought, that's weird. So we went around front, and they were doing thumbs down <laughs> under the Trump sign. So that, that'll probably be their Christmas card. So. Um, you, uh, we, we, we have a president who's leaving office now. You've written extensively about him, and some of these, um, uh, some of these essays are um, in here. Is Barry whiffing alone again, naturally? Obama's fl uh, uh, fl flickering greatness, uh, <laughs> the lost art of loyalty, no bully uh, in, uh, on the pul in the pulpit. Um, what do you think Obama's legacy is? Um, this is so funny because I first heard his name here in Chicago. My girlfriend, Julia DiLiberto, um, who's a brilliant writer who I've known since I worked for Time and she worked for People, magazine is here with me today. And she first told me about him because I was going to have a book party for my first book. She was giving me one in 2004. And she said, there's this politician here, Barack Obama, we should invite because he's a cross between JFK and Jesus. <laughs> I said, yeah, let's invite him. So we invited him to my book party, and he didn't come. But then I met him in white tie at the gridiron dinner, and you know, it wasn't white robes. <laughs> yeah, it may as well have been. And you know, sure enough, he was remarkable. And uh, that's how David and I spent a year and a half on the road together. And um, this. I went to Cuba with President Obama recently, and I was really struck that I was just really proud to have him as my president. And <laughs> and I am really proud to have Michelle as the first lady. <laughs> And in fact, I called over to Michelle's office recently, and I said, I don't think I've ever done this before as a columnist, but I'd like to do like a completely positive, glowing <laughs> Sure, they agree with that with a little bit of suspicion. Yeah, so they didn't do it because they probably didn't believe it. But, um, but anyway, they had the two girls who I think are off the charts, remarkable, and you know, always make our country look great. Um, but anyway, this is part, his overall legacy, I think he will be seen as a transformational president, you know, because of who he is. And um, his numbers are going up because I think that there's a whole generation, a younger generation, that doesn't realize that the Clintons, as David said, they have a good public servant side, but they also bring all this Michigas with them. You know, there's always all this smoke around them. You never know if it's a fire or not. Maureen's Jewish, by the way. I don't know if you... <laughs> and so, you know, I think people are beginning to realize, oh my gosh, we've had this amazing family in the White House that has had no ethical issues, no family drama, and, you know, whichever one of the other candidates we get, I think we can be sure there'll be those two things. And, um, and so the only, the only criticism I would have of him would be, and this would makes, be in this book. <laughs> no, there's nice things. I have my Cuba piece in there. But my only criticism is what makes me think that everything I've done professionally in my life is meaningless. Because you can never really know someone, even if you spend a year and a half on the road with them. Like, you know, so I covered W's campaign, and he said he would have a humble foreign policy and be bipartisan. And then 9-11 happened, and he got terrified because he knew he had spent the first 40 years of his life as a kind of wastrel. And he 
let Cheney and Romney like lead him to very, very bad places. And if 9-11 hadn't happened, he might have been a popular bipartisan president, who knows? But what you can't know is what historical event will happen and how that will interact with their gremlins. And so in the case of President Obama, it's just that I never would have thought or believed that he really didn't like politics because here is this guy who doesn't have a rich father, or any father really, so he doesn't have a rich daddy like W and JFK to help him get the election. You know, he does it all on his own. He's the first African American. I mean, what he accomplished was so amazing. And yet, when he got to Washington, it seemed like he didn't really like politics that much. So. As James Carville said to me, it's as though you found out Peyton Manning didn't like football. <laughs> or Mira Tandon said, it's as though you found out Bill Gates didn't like computers. It was just kind of an amazing thing. So well, that, you know, but, I think that's a little critique. But I will tell you what I tell people uh, from in Washington all the time who uh, despair the fact that they didn't spend enough time romancing uh, members of Congress and playing golf and dinners and so on. I say, he, he likes politics, he just doesn't like you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we have, uh, I, I, I'm sorry to be so um, maladroit, but do we, how are we taking questions here? Thank you both for being here. I would like to address the idea of 9-11 anniversary and the heat that generated from uh, Hillary getting sick afterwards. Does it ever occur to anybody that if she knew she was sick, she, if she didn't show up at that event, she had been the senator, she had done so much to help the firefighters and everything post 9-11. If she hadn't shown up, Trump would have made a big deal about that. So yes. That's my question. I, you know, I think Hillary, <clears throat> and even Trump have remarkable stamina. You know, I was on book tour for three days. I had a fever, and I sprained my ankle. <laughs> and she has been doing this for a year and a half. I don't, I don't think that was the problem. Let, let me just say, I thoroughly agree with everything you said. The issue was just how, once she became ill, it was handled. And the, just to put it in context, uh, she was under assault from Trump and Rudy Giuliani and others who were claiming she was not healthy enough and didn't have the stamina to be president. And so she was not uh, willing to acknowledge the fact that she was sick. And it goes to the larger problem, which is her instinct was to deal with it in a way that was less than forthcoming. And, and that's why I said the problem was stealth and not health, and she was reacting to the wrong problem. So I thoroughly agree with you. Look, I admire her for showing up there when her doctors told her she shouldn't. That, that's thoroughly admirable. And if she had just told that story, if her people had told that story instead of sort of sneaking off in six hours later acknowledging she had pneumonia, I think it would have gone over very, very well. So it's another case of her kind of a self-inflicted wound. You know, there's something interesting also. So I was talking, interviewing Donald Trump when he was formulating the stamina. That was going to be her insult. Like he gave me wacky and neurotic. He was going to say she had no stamina. And I said to him, that's ridiculous. She has enormous stamina. And But what's interesting about it is he never can criticize her for not being tough enough, which you would think would be the criticism of the first woman to run in a major party. So even Donald Trump cannot criticize her for that. He tries to criticize her on physical stamina, but he can't criticize her for not being tough. And in Hillary's case, usually women politicians get what's called a virtue advantage, uh, like they're considered more honest, and she doesn't get that. But no one questions her toughness. In fact, she gets most of what traditionally you would consider male right. attributes, strength, experience, you know, preparedness to be commander in chief. So uh, next, yeah. I'm of the opinion that uh, our next president will be female. <laughs> and more to your... Uh, Do you want to put a name to that? <laughs> You're not a Jill Stein guy, are you? <laughs> Touche. How will uh, Hillary's mental toughness uh, be uh, reflected in her 
response to Republican obstruction. I have. Um, well, okay, so I, I had dinner with a senator who's close to her the other night, and he thinks that she'll do better than we think with Mitch McConnell, that Mitch McConnell has regard for her and that she learns certain skills as a senator, you know, about how to flatter them and do things, you know, that... She'll do the things that Obama didn't do. Yeah. And, well, she has said that herself, that she would do that. But, um, you know, what worries me about Hillary is... I keep coming back to the original sin of the Iraq War, because I spent eight years writing about it with W. And I feel, you know, Hillary is Miss Homework. When she came to the Times endorsement session, she talked for the first 25 minutes about CAFTA. I mean, she is the most prepared person I've ever seen. And I just wish she had done her homework on that, because if she had read that national intelligence estimate, she would have known there was no case for war there. But Bill's advisors told her as the first woman, you know, she would have to vote for the war. And he, Bill had a very chilling quote at that point where he said, it's better to be strong and wrong than weak and right. And uh, she, more than any other senator, she went down to the floor and helped W make that fake connection between Al-Qaeda and Saddam. So what I wish for her and what I hope happens is that she uses that big brain of hers to make decisions for the right reasons and not for political viability reasons. Yeah, I would just say my, my, my concern is that uh, the Republican Party is incoherent right now. You've got center-right, corporate-oriented, pro-trade, pro-immigration reform, uh, Republicans who don't aren't interested in, in in social issues. You've got this populist group of uh, Trumps. You've got the sort of Ted Cruz and evangelical community. And it's very it's not a coherent party. And the one thing that unites them is anti anti Obama, and now it'll be anti Clinton. And so even if Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell want to work with her, it's going to be very difficult for them. And I think if Trump does, as is rumored, start, I know you think he's going away, but if he starts a media outlet with Steve Bannon uh, then uh, from Breitbart, uh, they're going to be waging war on any Republican who cooperates. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think it's going to be very challenging for her and uh, for the country. And I hope I'm wrong. It could go the other way. If Republicans were rational, they'd say we need to show we can govern, we can accomplish things, we, we've got to get this immigration reform thing off our plate. That's what a rational party would do, but um, I'm not sure that that applies here. David, you just got, you just got to my question, which is, uh, what is the future of the Republican Party post-election? And do you see a future uh, third party that, that could possibly come to the forefront? Well, the Republican Party is going to be two parties, right? We'll see. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 as I said, it should be. It should be. But whether it will be... And some people think that the, you know, Hillary is an incrementalist who probably is going to win in a year when there were revolutions on both sides. So some people think that the Democratic Revolution is only going to be delayed by four years. But Yeah, I mean, I think that... Um, it, it's going to take someone, if the Republican Party is going to stay whole, it's going to take some remarkable figure to uh, envision a, a future for the party that is encompassing enough to bring people along with them and is strong enough to overcome some of the more strident uh, voices and co opt some of the more strident voices. Who that is, uh, I don't know. But I will say this, 2008, 20 will have been the third Democratic administration if Hillary wins on November 8th. It's very hard to win a third term for one party. It's, it's, it's going to be uh, you know, much more difficult, I think, to win a fourth, particularly if the economy doesn't continue to grow and we hit a recession, which we're due for at some point in the next four years. So um, the Republicans may see an opportunity here 
and they may be desperate enough to win to make some adjustments, which is what happened with the Democratic Party after the 80s when Reagan uh, just beat the hell out of, of, of the Democratic Party. But how long do you think people like Paul Ryan and, and Kelly Iot and people who were the rising stars will suffer from the scarlet letter of Trump? Well, Kelly Ayotte may suffer from the scarlet letter of Trump on November 8th. Yeah. Uh, but the uh, the Paul Ryan question is an interesting question. We talked about this yesterday because he has this vision, this big tent vision, this Jack Kemp vision of the Republican Party. He's quite conservative, more than I think people realize. But he, at least his rhetoric, and he's been embracing of immigration reform and some other things that are completely antithetical to his caucus. Now he's going to lose a bunch of moderate Republicans, perhaps even up here in the northern suburbs. Uh, this November, and he's going to be left with a caucus that's smaller and more reactionary and very difficult to manage. And one interesting decision he's going to have to make is, does he want to be the Speaker of the House or does he want to be president and lead from outside uh, that, that post? But, you know, he has that Freedom Caucus. We said yesterday it's ironic to be enslaved by the Freedom Caucus, <laughs> but, but that's where it is. Do you think that James Comey had to do what he did, or should he have withheld the information? Well, you know, he had a kind of uh, Sophie's choice there, where he, um, if he, if he withheld the information, he would be charged with suppressing information, and so in the end, he found that the lesser problem. He did not want to be in a position where he was accused after the election of suppressing information, and that's how he made the decision. I think that's right. I think he thinks he was protecting his institution. The problem with it is that he released just enough information to inflame the campaign and not enough to understand what, what it was that he was talking about. And so he got trapped between wanting to, to be uh, uh, as Maureen said, wanting to be uh, transparent enough so that he can't, couldn't be accused of withholding information, but withholding enough information that he's actually now a major issue in the campaign. So I don't think he handled it very well. But let me just say, um, I am a, a, a former journalist and now kind of a quasi-journalist again. Um, but, uh, and, and so I read a lot of journalism uh, there isn't a better uh, and more fluent writer in American journalism than Maureen Dowd. So, <laughs> her columns are our literature, and some of it is uh, encompassed in this book. Uh, and uh, they're brilliant, and her essays in here are brilliant. And, uh, thank you very much. <laughs>